Welcome to part one of my tutorial on using Inkscape for illustration in science. I am a scientist and like most of you, I have to put together communicative graphical figures for manuscripts, illustrate certain experimental procedures as cartoons, and prepare posters for conferences using a vector editing program like Inkscape, Adobe Illustrator, or Corel Draw. At work, I have lots of commercial software for doing some tasks. I, however, come from Africa where many companies and institutes do not have the money to buy expensive software. So it's great to have several software that perform almost like the commercial ones. If you do not yet have the program, go to Inkscape.org and download Inkscape. It works for all operating systems like Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. Inkscape is free and almost as good as Adobe Illustrator or Corel Draw or some other equivalent. With Inkscape, you'll be able to do all of your scientific illustration tasks. Using a vector editing software like Inkscape, you'll make your work look better than if you had used any other software. In this series, we'll look at most of the basic concepts you need to to make professional figures, cartoons, and posters using Inkscape. Let's go ahead and download a version of Inkscape. So I'll click here, and here we see the different possibilities. Here we have Linux, Windows, Mac OS. So I'm going to download Windows. And on this next page, you have a 32-bit version and a 64-bit version. You have to verify whether your computer is 32 bits or 64 bits. If you have a 64-bit computer, you can download this version or this version. If you have just a 32-bit computer, you can download only this version. For both of them, you have different possibilities of installing. I have 64-bit Windows, so I'm going to download this and I save. And after downloading, if you're using Firefox like I'm using here, you go up here to this arrow and you have the downloaded file here. Double click on it. Here the next window comes up where you have the possibility to choose the different languages. I'll leave it at English and select OK, then go Next, and read the license information, and go Next, and leave this at default, and go Next, leave that at default, and go Next, and the installation begins. So the installation is complete, so I select Finish, and run Inkscape. So here's our fresh Inkscape program. The first thing you want to know when you get a new program like this is you want to understand the different functionalities before going on to use it. So up here you have the menu followed by the commands and then the tool controls, this and this. And you have snap controls here and you have scroll bars. Here you have a status window and you have a palette here. This is the page and this is the canvas. Each time when you start Inkscape, you will have such a graphical user interface or interface for short. I will refer to this alternately as the workspace. From this default page to see the properties of the page, you go to document, you can access it by taking file and here document properties, or you can access it from down here by selecting this and going here to document properties. Whichever way you select it, let's go to file and document properties. Once here you can define how the page looks like, you can define the display units, whether they are millimeters, centimeters, pixels. You can define the page size, A4 is here for default, and you can customize the width and the height and also the units as well as the scale and you can decide to show the border, the page border or not show it. You can also decide to show the border shadow or not show it. Up here you have further properties which you can look into. Here are the guides. You can decide to show the guides or not to show them. Here you have grid and here you can define the distances which will lead to a snap occurring. Here you have color properties, scripting, metadata, license. You have the snap controls. Let's close this and go back to the default page. To start describing the tools, I would like to pick this, create rectangular and squares, hold down the left mouse key and pull to draw one. So with this object on the screen, the first tool we look at is the selection tool. To use it, you left click on the tool and you see the shortcut is F1. And when you go back to an object, it is used to select, move, transform or scale objects click out of the object to release the selection. The next tool we'll look at is the Edit Path by Notes tool and the shortcut is F2. This tool will allow you to edit paths. The next tool we look at is the Tweak tool. The Tweak tool edits drawings by blurring the distinction between vector and raster graphics. Next, the Zoom tool or F3 for shortcut. It will allow us to zoom in and if we press the Shift key and zoom, we are going to zoom out. 
the next tool is the measurement tool or M and the next tool which we've already seen is the rectangle tool or short F4 which will allow us to draw squares and rectangles. The create 3D boxes or shift F4 for shortcut will create a box in a given three-dimensional perspective. The ellipse tool can be used to draw an ellipse cycle or arc. The star tool allows for drawing stars and regular polygons. The spiral tool can be used to draw shapes of spiral arcs, shortcut F9. The draw freehand lines or shortcut F6 can be used for drawing lines. The Bezier curve tool can be used for drawing Bezier curves and straight lines, shortcut Shift F6. The calligraphy tool can be used for dynamic drawing that will apply simple filters to the cursor, place and motion, shortcut Ctrl F6. The text tool is used for writing text. The spray symbol tool is used as a spray can. The eraser will erase existing paths. The bucket fill tool fills an unfilled area with color. And here we can create and edit gradients. Here below are swatches, which can be used for coloring objects. And below the swatches, we have the stroke and fill. O here means opacity. This eyeball, similar to what you know in Photoshop, is used to see the current layer or not if you select it. You could also select an active layer by using this drop down menu if you have more than one layer. And next here we have the status bar that shows what is going on on the page. To the right we have part of the menu beginning with different things that are almost redundant. This one creates a new document from a default template. This one opens an existing document. This saves the document. This prints. This imports a bitmap or SVG image. This exports the document or selection as a PNG image. This undoes the last action and this will take it back to the undone action. This copies the selection to the clipboard. Here we have the scissors tool to cut. This one pastes an object like Ctrl V. This zooms to fit a selection in the window. This zooms to fit drawing in a window. This zooms to fit a page in a window. This duplicates selected objects. This creates a clone of an existing object. This cuts the selected clones link to the original. This groups selected objects. And behind this we have some snap controls which we're going to look into. I won't be using all of them but especially I want to use snap guides or to use the snap to grid and the other things we're going to get to know them when need arises. We have rulers to the left here and to the top of the page and when you hover over the ruler you see what units the ruler is using. This again were set in document properties. When you select a tool the tool control bar is going to change give you specific functionalities linked to the tool. So here an example just notice how this bar is going to be changing and by doing that it's giving you extra functionality to each of the selected tools. You must have noticed that all of the tools have keyboard shortcuts at the back. It depends on you whether you want to do point and click or whether you want to use the shortcuts. It's a matter of personal preference. But if you decide to do point and click, there are some other essential shortcuts which will ease your work. So let's look at them. To illustrate their use, I'm going to draw an ellipse close to the original object and I'm going to change the color. So the first shortcut is Control A. If you take Control A, you're going to select everything. And I select just this one object now using the mouse. And if you take Control X, you're going to cut and if you take control V you're going to paste. If you were to select an object and do an action with it, let's take for instance delete and you want to undo the action, take control Z. Equally you can redo an undone action by taking control shift Z. And let us talk about guides. You can pull guides from the side by clicking on the ruler and pulling or from the top by clicking on the ruler and pulling or diagonally and pulling by coming with the mouse here and grabbing one of these small triangles if you can see there. Guides can be important to guide you where you're navigating on the page, how big your object should be or how small it should be relative to the page. To delete a guide you either pull it to the origin from where you took it or you select and hit delete. An alternative to using guidelines will be to use square grids. 
to call it up you hit the pound sign on your computer or you go to view and page grid you can on select back by going to view and page grid if you have the grid on it is important for you to know what the properties of the squares are what the length is and what the width is to do that you go to file document properties grids and here you're going to see properties of the grid you can define what unit you're using here i prefer using millimeters and here you can see origin x origin y and the spacing the x and the y you can adjust this to suit your wish so right now we have 0.264 millimeters as the X spacing and 0.264 as the Y spacing. Let's say if we put this to 1 and 1 and we close, we will now have this distance corresponding to 1 millimeter. This way it is easier for us to determine what the actual length or the height of our objects are. I do not like using square grids because of my eyes and because it box the object I'm drawing. I'll show you another possibility to actually determine what the length and the height of your objects are. So I take away the square grid. If you select a guide, double click on it, a window will pop up that will show you where the X position is and where the Y position is. So this is the X direction. If we want to define where this line is going to be, we can just come here and put the value. If we write 15 in there, for instance, and hit OK, just watch what will happen to this line. It's moved relatively. If we wanted to also define this one, we could actually double click on it. And if we put say 180 in there, Watch what happened. So this way we can define the origin of our guideline and the final position and do our drawings so that they fit a particular specification. What we did for these vertical guidelines, you can also do for the horizontal guidelines by defining what positions they will be in. So in that case, I will have to pull a second guideline from up there, put it down here, double click on it to define what position I want it to be, and also relatively double click this first one and define what position I want it to be. You may be using an Inkscape program that has been set up differently by some other person, or you may have mistakenly changed the setup, or you must have installed Inkscape on another platform that makes it look different from mine. Before we go deep into using the program, let us look at the workspace or interface which I defined before. Your workspace or interface may look different from this thus there are things you should be aware of. First let us select the view menu and go to show height. Here you notice that you can show or hide the command bar, the snap control bar, the tool control bar, the toolbox, the rulers. If we choose the rulers for instance you see they disappear. We go again to view, show hide, we call up our rulers. Similarly if you go to view and show hide and you let the control bars go they are no longer there so let's go and put it back. The second thing to be aware of if you go to view you see here what the screen should look like. Here you have default, custom and mine is set on white screen. If you choose the different options options you're going to see that your screen looks differently so I'll go back to white that was a good minimal overview on how to install and set up Inkscape thank you for watching do not forget to give us a thumbs up please leave any questions or comments below otherwise see you next time